price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I I'm Nelson. I'm Emma. I'm Joshi. Today's verse comes from Psalm 145, verse 1 to 3. I will exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Happy Thanksgiving! Happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy, the Enjoy the service! Rescued for your glory, we 
We cried, Jesus, set our hearts towards you, that every eye would see you, lifted up, King of heaven, come. Your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to save in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. We will sing your praise. 
church as we move into the hearing of God's word why don't we take a moment to greet our family members in the church why don't we say hi good morning uh, send your favorite emoji to each other uh, and let's receive from God's word together as a family today Good morning, MCBC. My name is Pastor Freddy. Welcome to our church. We're now going to have our corporate prayer. Our prayer today 
is found in the Book of Common Prayers, and it says this, Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given good work to good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that we can come here to praise and worship you, Lord. And Father, indeed, we are counted privileged that we can be your sons and daughters. And Father, we pray, Lord, that we are once again reminded of what you have done for us. You are our saving King, who, because of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, died for our sins, took away our shame by being nailed to the cross for sins he did not commit, for uh, shame that he was not supposed to bore. Father, now we can be set free and that we can now have a relationship with you for all eternity, starting at this very minute, Lord. And yet, Father, we know that because of sin, because of greed, because of selfishness, Lord, there's so much that we still need to pray for that can be transformed in us, but that can also be transformed uh, in those who are around us, Lord. Father, as we see our COVID cases spike to over 900 uh, this past week, Lord, Father, we're reminded of our civil responsibility to be able to be good citizens uh, where we are, Lord, to uh, have the social distance, to have uh, our, our immediate family uh, bubbles. Lord, Father, help us to know what it means and make that sacrifice this Thanksgiving. And uh, Father, we just pray, Lord, that we can uh, be a part in helping to stop the spread of COVID-19. We continue to pray for the first uh, uh, line workers. We continue to pray for the restaurant owners who must be uh, devastated that, especially in Toronto, uh, in Ottawa, and in Peel, that they have to be shut down once again, along with gyms, uh, along with bars, along with uh, many other uh, venues, Lord. We pray for those that will be out of a job, Lord. Father, they were just hoping to get uh, back on track, Lord, which reminds us how important it is that we um, must remain vigilant and that we must uh, not uh, try to create situations where we would suscept uh, others or ourselves uh, to the spreading of this uh, uh, deadly virus, Lord. Father, we also continue to pray for um, the, the, the government, Lord, uh, that the way is so heavy on them right now. We pray, Lord, uh, that there would be more understanding, less blaming and more cooperation, that both the government, if they have made uh, some uh, missteps, Lord, and also us as citizens, Lord, if we have made some missteps, Lord, that we would confess it so that we can together move forward uh, in order to long for a day when things would be opened again, Lord. And that would include our church building. And Father, because of these rising cases, even here in York Region, we know that this is not the time uh, to open up. So Father, may you give us that perseverance needed to continue to meet online through Zoom for our small groups, uh, for our Bible studies on Sundays, for our worship service, Lord, and many other opportunities where we can care for one another. Last but not least, we pray for our tithes and offering. May it be something that is uh, used by you uh, for your glory and for your kingdom purposes, Lord. We pray that we'll be able to bless the least of these with the much of this that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there are now four different ways that you can give to MCBC. First, you can drop off uh, the uh, offering in an envelope uh, from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, at our address at 9580 Woodbine Avenue. Uh, alternatively, you can also mail it to that same address. Thirdly, you can uh, put it into our PayPal fundraising account. Uh, and lastly, you can also use Interact Transfer. So please give generously as there are many, many needs, especially uh, from those uh, who may not be even attending our church.
We're so glad that this morning we can have our guest speaker uh, to speak with us. Reverend Fred Tam has been a minister of the gospel for over 20 years. His calling has been to uh, speak to the English-speaking Chinese and Asian communities. He was subsequently the lead pastor uh, and also part of the pastoral team of Millican Gospel Church, Richmond Hill Christian Community Church, uh, Scarborough Chinese Alliance Church. He has shepherded multiple uh, multicultural congregations of adults and young people in small, medium, and large size settings. Uh, Pastor Tam's current most challenging and rewarding role, of course, is being a husband and father, and his wife, Catherine, is a teaching a teacher of special needs middle school children in the challenging neighborhood of Jane and Finch. She also graduated from Tyndale Seminary in clinical counseling. Pastor Fred's three sons include Daniel, Michael, and Joseph. Uh, and uh, we're so happy that Pastor uh, Fred Tam can give his message to us this morning. Please let us, uh, uh, you know, cheer in our own homes uh, for our guest speaker today, Pastor Fred Tam. Hello, Markham Chinese Baptist Church. My name is uh, Reverend Fred Pham, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share God's word with you today. Let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I've been a pastor for many years in various churches, and some people confuse me with my twin brother. His name is Ted Tham. Uh, I'm Fred Tham, and he's also an English pastor in a Chinese church. And he is actually, uh, he's not, I'm also not, Freddie Lamb, who is obviously, I'm not Freddie Lamb, your English pastor, even though our names sound very familiar. Now, all of us are ethnically Chinese, and Ted and I, my twin brother and I, we grew up in Canada. And as we grew up, there was a historical tension that many of you are aware about. Uh, you, you know about this tension, and that's the question of identity of Canadians, and particularly the French-speaking Canadians from Quebec, the Francophones. I have relatives actually that are from Quebec that, uh, that are French speaking, and they took part in referendums. There were actually two referendums in 1980 and 1995, and they asked the question about the role of, Fr of, of French speaking people in Canada. Were they what they called a distinct society? And the question I have is, if the Francophones are a distinct society in Canada, then what about the Chinese? What about the English speaking Chinese? You know, struggling with identity is always an issue, issue. And for myself growing up as English speaking Chinese in Canada, my, the issue of my identity always came up when I was a young person. So when I had children of my own, I have three sons. When my eldest son was maybe about four or five years old, uh, Daniel, he came to me one day and he always does it. Back then he always did it while I was, I was shaving for some reason, bizarre reason. He always looked at me while I was shaving. He asked me some, a question and the, or we talked while I was shaving. And so I, one day I did say, I went to Daniel and I said to him, Daniel, are you Canadian or are you Chinese? I wanted to help him to go along that journey to discover who he was. And he turned to me and he was thinking about it. And he said, hmm, daddy, I think I'm a beluga. <laughs> now, you know what a beluga is, right? A beluga whale, right? And I thought about it. You know, he, we had just gone to marine land the week previously. So somehow we connected being a beluga, right? So I thought maybe he's a little bit young to figure that out, right? So what happened is a little bit later when Daniel was a little older, uh, I, I said to him, uh, about, a, a year, about a year later, I said to him, uh, I, I, tried, I tried a different approach. I tried to lead him to discover who he was, right? His identity. I said, Daniel, you know, you, know, you know, logically, most people who are Italian, they come from Italy. And most Brazilian people come from Brazil. And most Russian people come from, from Russia, right? And he, 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 he got that. And then I said to Daniel, I said, where do you think most Canadians come from? Now, it's a bit of a trick question. I want him to think about being Chinese and Canadian. And he thought about it. I could see this little mind just grappling with that tough question. And then he turned to me and said, Daddy, I know. He goes, I, most Canadian people come from Canadian Tire. <laughs> so that really got me. Uh, I realized that maybe I should talk more about that a little later. You know, multiculturalism is a big issue too in Canada. That's a, another identity issue. 
my second son, Michael, when he was around 10 years old, now, now surprise, surprise, he was really into playing video games. It's like a lot of you still are, but he was into playing video games. And we had uh, this Nintendo set at home. One day, there's a picture there, there of him playing uh, video games, but that's a David Buster, that's, that's not at home. But when we were at home one day, he was, uh, he was playing against me, we were playing Nintendo, and I'm terrible at video games. And he was beating me really badly. But then I noticed that while he was beating me on the, the game that was, that was on the TV, it was, it, was, it, was, it was showing on the TV, he was playing, every now and then he turned around and he started playing something else. And then I realized, you know, he was playing two games at one time and he was beating me <laughs> while, he, while he was playing the other game. And I said to him, Michael, what are you doing? And Michael turned to me and said, hey, daddy, don't worry about it. I'm multicultural. <laughs> Now, I don't want to, he meant multitasking, right? <laughs> but, the, the, you know, the, the question is, what does it mean to be English speaking Chinese or, or Chinese or Asian or whatever ethnicity you're, you're from, right? It could be, you know, it could be a, a, a part of Asia, part of Africa, whatever. What does that mean, right? And who are we as Christians? Is there a distinct Christian society other than that? Than that? Well, there is. Biblically, it's really clear that no matter what ethnicity we're all, we're part of, we're part of a unique society in Christ because of the gospel. Every Christian is part of a unique society that has many distinctives, but I want to share with you four distinctives today that are just central to who we are as Christians. It should make all the difference in how the church operates and what we do as a church. But in order to do that, I need to give you some context. And here's the context. We're in the book of Romans. It's a letter the Apostle Paul wrote, the Apostle to the, to the Gentiles. And the book of Romans, it's the heart of where many great revivals to the truth of God's word throughout the church age are connected to the book of Romans. Augustine was converted reading a verse from Romans. Martin Luther unleashed the Ref Reformation by gaining a renewed understanding of what this epistle says, this letter says. He wrote Romans, this, this is a quote from Martin Luther in, uh, in one of his commentaries. He wrote this, Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and the purest gospel. It is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart. <laughs> Did you get that? Martin Luther is advocating that we all memorize the book of Romans, okay, in the Greek, okay. But we should occupy, your, but every Christian should occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. It can never be read or pondered too much. And the more it is dealt with, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. You see how much Martin Luther loved Romans? John Wesley, he said this. He, was a, he, he, was, he said that he was converted. Now, by the way, at that time, he was an ordained minister in the Church of England, but he came to real faith in Jesus Christ as he listened to a pastor reading the preference to Luther's commentary on Romans, from which I just read to you earlier. So John Wesley was converted by the, the knowledge of Romans. What about this book? Of, what's so special about this book? Well, it was written by the Apostle Paul around AD 57, right? Near the end of his third missionary journey, probably from Corinth. Now, that's so significant, AD 57. That's like within one generation after the death of Christ. Think about that, uh, after his crucifixion. That's amazing. So people are still around who can testify to the truth of this, of, of this epistle. He was on his way, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem for distribution of an offering that the Gentile churches had collected for the church at Jerusalem. And he planned to go to Rome afterwards. And, on his, and then he was on his way to Spain. And he, that's the other uttermost ends of the earth back then, right? He used this letter to introduce himself to the Roman church, whom he had never met before. He also hoped to get help from them on his way to Spain. This was, a, this was a fundraising, <laughs> in a sense, it was a fundraising epistle, right? And a quick summary of the book of Romans, which is very significant because it gives us the context of today's passage, is this. Here's the context. The overall theme of Romans is the gospel. Now, <clears throat> it's not just justification by faith, although justification by faith is a key concept, a key doctrine. But the whole theme of Romans is the gospel itself. And there's three main sections. 
there's a section that start, I, I, I label guilt, chapters one to three. All men are guilty. In chapter three, verse 10, it says, no one is righteous. Chapter three, verse 23, we are all sinners and come short of the glory of God. Then there's grace, chapters four to 11. In chapter five, verse eight, God loves sinners. Chapter six, verse 23, all sinners deserve eternal death, but Christ offers eternal life. Chapter 10, verse 13, God promises that whoever trusts Christ shall be saved. Wow, what a great promise. And then, chapter, and then chapters 12 to 15 is the natural outworking of guilt and grace, right? We're this is gratitude. Our passage today starts off with this, the word therefore. Therefore, it says it's the result and logical response of the other previous sections. Our passage today is a key passage because it introduces and summarizes what will come in the final sections of Romans. These few verses kind of encapsulates and sets the stage for the last three, three chapters in Romans. It's an amazingly important passage. One of my favorite passages, by the way, and I'll explain to you why a little later, okay? What does it tell us about who we are as Christians? Well, four words, right? First, very quickly, first of all, there is the word motivation. In view of God's mercy, our motivation for service is to be based upon gratitude. You know, the pictures there are of Auschwitz in Poland. In late 19, July 1941, Maximilian Kolbe was a Franciscan priest. He was put in an infamous death camp for helping Jews escape Nazi terrorism. Three prisoners had escaped from the camp. The camp rule was enforced. Because people had escaped, even though it was only three, 10 people would be rounded up randomly, herded into a cell where they would die of starvation and exposure as a lesson against future escape attempts. It was a cruel punishment to prevent more escape attempts. So names are being called. One of the prisoners, he, he has a, a long Polish name, is Franciszek Gajonisek. Franciszek Gajonisek. He was called and he cried out, my wife, my children because he knew he was going to starve to death. But then this, this priest, Maximilian Kolba, stepped forward and very calmly volunteered himself. He said, I will take his place. Kolba marched to the cell with nine others where he managed to live all the way up to August the 14th, and they died of starvation. You know, this story was chronicled on an NBC News special when uh, Gajonosek, was 82 years old, the prisoner that was saved. He lived a full life because of the sacrifice of Maximilian Koba. The video shows him telling a story while tears are streaming down his cheeks and a mobile camera follows him around to his little, in his little white house in a marble, there's a marble monument carefully tended to with flowers. And the inscription read, reads this, in memory of Maximilian Koba, he died in my place. Because every day this man lived since 1941, he lived with the knowledge, I lived because someone died for me. Every year on August 14th, he travels to Auschwitz in memory of Kolba. You know, John 15 verse 13, Jesus' words, because he lived it and he sacrificed it. He said, greater love has no one than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. Hudson Taylor made a comment at the end of his life, that great missionary to the Chinese, the interior part of Chinese, opening up the great continent, continent. We are, many of us are the recipients of his great sacrifice. Hudson Taylor at the end of his life was being interviewed and they, someone asked him why he did everything that he did. He suffered so much. He said this, the love of Christ compels me to serve. It's a quote from 2 Corinthians 5.14. Gratitude is the greatest motivator. My question to you today is what motivates you? Why are you serving? What is a, your motive for giving? Is it power? Is it respect? Is it recognition? Do you feel compelled to serve? Is it just because of habit? Is it because of your parents? Is it because you're a spouse? Our motivation is best revealed 
in our response to hardship. When our motivation is gratitude, so much can be done. Second word, very quickly, dedication. We're told in these verses we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. What does living sacrifices mean? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, we're told that we are to be living stones, not dead or lifeless. The word for sacrifices here is hola, which reminds us of the Old Testament. It means, it means to burn up completely. This is the word from which we get the word holocaust, totally burnt up. And in order to do so, to be that sacrifice, you must be richly pure to be accepted. And what are we to offer? We are to offer our bodies. Now, very quickly, there are different ways of looking at the body, right? Some people consider the body, they, they, let me help you memorize it. Remember what, what, what some, how some people look at the body. Some people look at, they deify the body. They worship the body in exercises, fitness, right? <laughs> and you know some people like that. I'm so jealous of some of them, but you know, anyways, some people deify the body though. They, they take it far too much. Other people denigrate the body, like the Gnostics who elevate the soul and the mind above the body. Other people defile the body. Drugs, drink, gluttony, immorality. But what does the Bible tell us? We must dedicate our bodies. First Corinthians chapter six, verse 19 to 20 tells us to do that. Our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And what is dedication? You know, the world has many examples. Uh, you look at athletes, professional athletes, the dedication to their craft, professional musicians, people who are at the top of their fields in any area. Dedication. <laughs> There's no such thing as it, it comes just naturally. Okay? There might be some natural component, but the dedication is where is, is, is what gets them to the top. But in the Christian world, we are to be just as dedicated as the rest of the world. Christians to be much more dedicated, actually, because we have such a great motivation and gratitude. You know, Handel, who was a Christian, he wrote the Messiah, which is a Christmas, um, Christmas, uh, uh, Christmas work that is so famous. He spent 23 days in seclusion, often without food, to write that. In the Bible, we're told that Moses fasted for 40 days. Right? St. Francis did that later on. Einstein, right? even though he was not a Christian, he showed dedication. I read a story about him working on one of his theses or one of his papers, and he was writing so furiously, he cut himself on the, on the forehead with his pen, right? and the blood started dripping on his paper, and he just ignored it because he had to get it down. You know, dedication is a mother or father dedicated to their child, giving up all for them. I remember reading about the dedication of Meryl Streep. She's a famous actress. For those of you that are, 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 are younger, you don't remember her, but she still works today. And she's a famous actress. She's won the most Oscars or something like that. Meryl Streep, when she was so, so dedicated to her craft of acting, once she was in a movie, uh, Iron Week, and she was supposed to portray a person who had died, right? And... She was so good at it, and she stayed dead after that scene was filmed. The director had to shake her, and people were afraid that she actually died. <laughs> you know, I remember I worked in Hungary as an engineer for like six, seven years, right? And during that time when I was an engineer uh, for General Electric, right, and we were doing some work there, I remember talking, reading about a Hungarian swimmer, who, one of the most decorated Olympians in, in, in Hungary's uh, history. And he, someone once asked him, uh, how, do you, how, can he, how does he spot a winner? And he says, well, take, take 10 boys. I remember, he goes something like this. Take like 10 boys that, are, that want to be great swimmers, Olympic swimmers. Put their hands in a, in a pot of water. And then slowly turn up the heat. <laughs> oh, this is, sounds cruel. He says, slowly turn up the heat. The one who leaves his hand in there the longest is the one that's going to be the winner. <laughs> The one who could take it, the one who has the commitment, right? There are so many stories of Christian missionaries. Uh, one day I'd love to share them with you because that's, that's my, right, one of my, my greatest treats is reading and sharing stories of Christian missionaries. But they're my heroes. But, uh, but there's so many stories because Jesus' great commission requires great commitment. He made it clear that discipleship is not a, for the faint of heart. 
It's easy to be a follower for, for, with Jesus when he's doing miracles and filling your stomach with bread and with fish. But when Jesus starts talking about the true spiritual quality of the kingdom, about the sacrifice necessary to achieve it, many of his disciples went back, we're told in John chapter 6, verse 66. They went back and walked no more with him because they couldn't take it. As they put it in John chapter 6, verse 60, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? You know, the surprising thing is that Jesus did not go running after those people who left him to get them to stay in his membership role. He was training kingdom leaders for the, for the, he was lead, training leaders for the kingdom. And if they're going to be fit vessels for service, they're going to have to pay the price. And remember, the key is that it's not just us working harder. That's not what Christ is saying. For Christians, dedication is not just our own focus and strength. It comes from God's resources through his spirit. How much dedication do you show? I want to ask you that today. Who picks up the ball, stays the latest, does the jobs nobody else wants to do? You know, there's so many stories of community members who burn out because others are not doing their, their, doing their part. Is the Lord asking you to volunteer, even for a long-range project, to disciple someone, to teach a class, to encourage someone. Okay, let me, let me give you a little bit of a personal testimony right now. I've just come back a couple hours ago from um, just before filming this. I just came back from spending four and a half hours in the emergency room at our local hospital. Uh, I had eaten some sushi the night before. I had a terrible allergic reaction and uh, my, my throat got so swollen. My tongue got so swollen, I had trouble breathing. And then, uh, so now I have to get an EpiPen and all that sort of stuff, right? But I just wanna let you know that I, I thought, you know, why should I, why should I do this sermon now? But I realized, you know what? It's, the Lord healed me and I've got, we've got great systems here in Canada. I can be thankful for that. But if I give up so easily, what kind of testimony is that, right? So that's, so I'm here today, <laughs> right? So uh, that's dedication. Quickly, renunciation, right? There's so much in this passage. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Now, the question that we ask, what do you mean by the world? Now here, the world does not mean the creation. Rather, because the world, word, world has many different meanings in scripture. It refers to the worldly perspective or the secular mindset. What is the secular mindset? Well, there's a lot of isms right, that is secular. There's pessimism, right? What are the last seven words of dying church? We've never done it that way before, <laughs> right? There's, you know, by the way, change for change's sake isn't good. But we should be open to ideas. Legalism is a worldly mindset. Jesus reserved his harshest judgments for legalistic Pharisees. You notice that in the, in the Gospels. Materialism is a biggie. Why do we work so hard? Do you really need that specific kind of clothing or car or entertainment? Why are so many students working so hard? Why do spiritual life, worship, fellowship, and devotion always take last place? You know, money, the love of money, is the greatest idol in scripture. That's what Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. Because he knew that money is a big issue for a lot of people. And I have so much to share with you about that as well. One day. But I want to ask you right now, what are your priorities? What do you spend your time on? Martin Luther said, whatever you spend your time on, whatever is your, whatever, whatever is your priority, that becomes your idol or your God. Now, finally, transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Transformation, not like a toy transformer, or a chameleon with changes back and forth, rather transformed like a caterpillar into a butterfly. You know, I have a good friend from high school. He wasn't in my school, but he knew my school very well because he used to deal drugs there when he was a, a, drug, a drug dealer. He was caught, put in jail for a little while. The Lord saved him miraculously. He was transformed. Jeff became a missionary. He went off to Africa, had a bunch of children, okay? 
he has, he's my age, he has a bunch of grandchildren now. <laughs> he's, he's, he's quite, he had them quite young. But Jeff was transformed by the spirit. There's a book and a movie called Miracle on the River Kwai. It's by Ernest Gordon. And it talks about Japanese, so, Scottish soldiers in a Japanese labor camp. One day they were in a work detail, they were missing a shovel and one prisoner sacrificed himself because there was a miscount. The, 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 the commander of the Japanese camp was so upset, so mad at them because a shovel that was missing meant uh, uh, the, the, the uh, possibility of a tool for escape, right? And so he went down and asked all the soldiers, who is it that stole that shovel? And then one soldier stepped forward and, and confessed to it. And the, the commander was so upset, he took another shovel and he beat that guy to death in front of everybody else. And then later on, at the next work detail, they found that the, the miscount, there was a miscount. There actually wasn't a, uh, there, there was not a shovel missing. That one soldier at the previous decal, a detail had stepped forward to sacrifice himself so that nobody else would be punished. And then that transformed that POW camp. The soldiers realized that one of their colleagues had sacrificed himself for them. And later on in the movie and in the book, when the Japanese were, were finally uh, taken over and the, the war was ended, there was a possibility of the Scottish soldiers taking revenge on their captors, but they didn't do that. One of them stepped up and said, no more killing. Now what we need is forgiveness. Forgiveness at the heart of the gospel, by the way. I wanna share that with you one day more. Sacrif sacrificial love has transforming power. Have you been transformed into something beautiful for God? Is it obvious to the world? Do friends see any difference? Is God still transforming you? When's the last time you repented of a sin? When's the last time you've changed for the gospel's sake? Let me for finally conclude with an amazing, wonderful, life-transforming conclusion. Something that a lot of you young adults, and really everybody that is a thoughtful person, asked the question later on in life. This question, what is the will of God? How do I know the will of God? We're told in these verses how to know the will of God. Because these things, they lead to the result in verse 2 of knowing the will of God. What every college student and young person needs. These verses, by the way, transformed my life. I told you that earlier that for years I, I was an engineer uh, working for General Electric in Hungary, in Budapest, Hungary. I was considering my future back then, doing quite well actually as an engineer, <laughs> making more money than I, than I even make, ever made afterwards as a pastor. And I was just like a, a young engineer. But the verse, I asked a Southern Baptist minister who was the pastor of the church that I was, I, was, I was worshiping with. I was worshiping, at first when I didn't know Hungarian, I worshiped in an international Baptist church. And I asked the pastor, the visiting pastor who was from the uh, Southern Baptist pastor, Reverend Dr. William Lumpkin. Uh, he's passed away now, but he was a seminary professor. He knew church history and he was so old, he probably lived it. <laughs> no, he, he knew church history really well. He was there in Budapest. One day when I was asking myself, how do I know the will of God for my life? He's, I was contemplating leaving engineering and entering ministry. He shared with me these verses. He shared with me that if you do these things, right, then you'll know the will of God. Because it's all logical. Think about the progression, the context, right? I said the context of these ver verses were so important. Think about it. Guilt, grace, which is the gospel, gratitude, wisdom. And what's the final thing is humility. Humility to work with people, to, to, to reach out to a world that hates God. The people that are on the fringes of society, that makes the church different, makes it a distinct society. There is a story shared by Tony Campolo in his book called The Kingdom of God as a Party, God's Radical Plan for His Family. And it's a story that 
that he shares, he shared many years ago. He's a sociologist for the States. I met him maybe 10 times in the past. And it, it, I want to share the story with you. It's a little bit long and I, I'm almost sure some of you have heard this story before. So uh, if you've heard it, then enjoy it again. Okay. <laughs> and uh, don't laugh at me for sharing something that, that you've heard before, but enjoy it again. But if you haven't heard it, I want you to enjoy the story. I'm going to read to you. It's from Tony Campola once again, and he calls it the Agnes story. He says, if you live on the East Coast and travel to Hawaii, you know that there's a time difference that makes three o'clock in the morning feel like nine. And with that in mind, you'll understand that whenever I go out to our 50th state, I find myself wide awake long before dawn. That's like me this morning when I had to go to emergency, okay? Not only do I find myself up and ready to go, to go while almost everybody else was still asleep, but I find that I want breakfast when almost everyone on the island is still, so on, everything on the island is still closed, which is why I was wandering up and down the streets of Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning, looking for a place to get something to eat. And up a side street, I found a little place that was still open. And Tony goes on to say, I went in, I took a seat on one of the stools on the counter and awaited to be served. This was one of those sleazy places that deserves the name Greasy Spoon, okay? <laughs> I mean, I did, not, I did not even touch the menu. I was afraid that if I opened the, that thing, something gruesome would crawl out, but it was, only a, it, but it was the only place I could find, okay? <laughs> right. And then he says this in his book, he says, the fat guy behind the counter came over and asked me, what do you want? I told him, a cup of coffee and a donut. He poured a cup of coffee, and he wiped his grimy hands on his, on his, on his, on his smudgy apron, and then he grabbed a donut off the shelf behind him. <laughs> now, I'm a realist. I know that in the back room of that restaurant, donuts are probably dropped on the floor and kicked around. But when everything is out front where I can see it, I really would have appreciated it if he had used a pair of tongs and placed the donut on some wax paper. <laughs> and as I sat there munching on my donut and sipping my coffee at 3.30 in the morning, the door of the diner suddenly swung open. And to my discomfort, it in marched eight or nine provocative and boisterous prostitutes. It was a small place. They sat on either side of me. Their talk was loud and crude. I felt completely out of place and was just about to make my getaway when I overheard the woman sitting beside me say, tomorrow's my birthday. I'm gonna be 39. Her friend responded in a nasty kind of tone. So, what do you want from me? A birthday party? What do you want? You want to get me a cake and you want me to get you a cake and sing happy birthday? Oh, come on, said the woman next to me. Why do you have to be so mean? I was just telling you, that's all. Why do you have to put me down? I was just telling you it was my birthday. I don't want anything from you. I mean, why do you give me a, why, why should you give me a birthday party? I've never had a birthday party my whole life. Why should I have one now? And then Tony Campolo goes on and says this. When I heard that, I made a decision. I sat and waited until the woman had left. And then I called over the fat guy behind the counter and I asked him, do they come in here every night? Yeah, he said. The one right next to me, I asked, does she come in here every night? Yeah, he said, that's, that's Agnes. She comes in here every night. Why do you want to know? And then Tony Campolo continued, because I heard her say that tomorrow is her birthday. Birthday. What do you think about us throwing a birthday party for her right here tomorrow night? A smile slowly crossed his chubby face and he answered with measured delight. That's great. I like it. That's a great idea. Calling to his wife who did the cooking in the back room, he shouted, hey, come out here. This guy's got a great idea. Tomorrow's Agnes's birthday. This guy wants us to go, wants us to go in with him and throw a birthday party for her right here tomorrow night. His wife came out of the back room all bright and smiley. And she said, that's wonderful. You know, Agnes is one of those people who are really nice and kind and nobody ever does anything nice and kind for her. Look, I told her, told them, 
If it's okay, so if it's okay with you, I'll get back here tomorrow morning around 2.30 and decorate the place. I'll even get a birthday cake. No way, said Harry. That, that's the guy's name, right? That was his name. The birthday cake is my thing. I'll make the cake. So at 2.30 the next morning, I was back at the door, diner. I picked up some crepe paper decorations at the store and made a sign on the big piece of the cardboard that read, Happy Birthday, Agnes. I decorated the diner from one end to the other. I had that diner looking good. The woman who did the cooking must have gotten the word out on the street because by 3.15, every prostitute in Honolulu was in that place. It was wall-to-wall -wall prostitutes. And me, <laughs> says Tony. <laughs> At 3.30, on the dot, the door of the diner swings open and in comes Agnes and her friend. I had everything ready, he says. After all, I was, I was the MC of the, of the whole affair. And when they came in, he, we all screamed, happy birthday. Never have I seen a person so flabbergasted, so stunned, so shaken. Her mouth fell open. Her legs seemed to buckle a bit. Her friend gathered, grabbed her arm to steady her. And as she was led to one of the stools along the counter, we all sang happy birthday to her. And as we came to the end of our singing, happy birthday, dear Agnes, happy birthday to you, her, her eyes started to moisten. Then when the birthday cake with all the candles lit on it was carried out, she just lost it. She openly cried. Harry gruffly mumbled, blow out the candles, Agnes. Come on, blow out the candles. If you don't blow out the candles, I'm gonna have to blow out the candles. And after an endless few seconds, he did. <laughs> Harry, Harry blew out the candles. Then he handed her a knife and he told her to cut the cake. Come on, Agnes. Yo, Agnes, we all want some cake. Agnes looked down at the cake. And then without taking her eyes off it, she slowly and softly said, look, Harry, if it's all right with you, I mean, if it's okay, I, I kind of, all I want to ask you is this, is it okay if I keep the cake a little, I mean, is it all right, is it all right if I don't eat it right away? Harry shrugged his shoulders and answered, sure, it's okay. If you want to keep the cake, keep the cake. Take it home if you want to. Can I? She asked, then looking at me, she said, I live just down the street, a couple of doors. I want to take the kick home and show it to my mother, okay? I'll be right back, honest. So she got off the stool, picked up the cake and carried it like it was the holy grail. She walked slowly towards the door and as we all stood there motionless, she left. And when the door closed, there was a stunned silence in the place. Not knowing what else to do, I broke up, I broke the silence by saying, what do you say we pray? Looking back on it all now, it seems more than a little strange for a sociologist, that's, that was Tony Campoli, he's a sociologist, to be leading a prayer meeting with a bunch of prostitutes in a diner at, at Honolulu at 3.30 in the morning. But it just felt like the right thing to do. I prayed for Agnes, I prayed for her salvation, I prayed that her life would be changed and that God would be good to her. And when I finished, Harry leaned over the counter and said, hey, you never told me that you were a preacher. What kind of church do you belong to? And in one of those moments when just the right words came to me, come, came, I answered, I belong to a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3.30 in the morning. Harry waited a moment and then he answered, no, you don't. There's no church like that. And if there was, I'd join it. I'd join a church like that. Christians comprise a unique society in this world. There are at least four distinctives that should identify the Church of Christ. Our motivation, which comes from gratitude. Our dedication, we are to be living sacrifices, hola. Our renunciation. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Our transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. And the result, 
is wisdom and humility. And I want to add one more final result. The final result is an amazing church that changes the world one person at a time. God bless you, Markham Chinese Baptist Church. Let's change the world together.
Good morning, church. My name is Jonathan Wong, and I'm one of the English deacons here. And this is this week's announcements. Uh, first off, about the uh, grocery store drive. Um, thank you so much for your generosity, guys. We've received over $735 in gift cards in the past three weeks. And uh, so thank you so much for your generosity because those gift cards are going to be used to bless other people. Um, at this time, we're going to pause collection of those gift cards uh, until January 2021. But um, in the interim, we're going to be distributing those cards. So thank you again and God bless you for your generosity. The second announcement for this week is about the new media ministry. Again, if you have a... Um, passion for video production, video recording, website design, social media, anything like that, um, you might want to check out the new media ministry at MCBC. So consider sending an email to newmedia at mcbc.com. Again, that's newmedia at mcbc.com to get in touch with someone who's going to give you more information. And uh, again, for those of us who are also looking for pastoral support during this time, maybe it's just someone you want to talk to or someone you want to pray with. Um, our pastors and deacons are all open to reaching out to you and talking to you. Uh, check out mcbc.com for a list of contact information. And that's it for this week's announcements. Uh, before we go, why don't we pray together? Gracious Father, thank you for everything that you've provided for us during this time. In our times of need, Lord, you have not abandoned us but you have been with us and that you love us and that you provide for us in the ways that we can't even imagine. At the same time, God, we know that there are needs in our church. There are people who are still reaching out for community, people who are longing to go deeper in their relationship with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would provide to us, that you would give us, Lord, ways to connect with one another and ways to connect with you. God, I also pray for wisdom for our church leaders as we try to figure out what to do in this pandemic time to reach as many churched and unchurched people as we can. God, I pray that you would also help us use our resources wisely, that we'd be able to use them in a way to bless others and to be a light in this community. Finally, God, we want to thank you for all the work that Jesus did on the cross for our sins, that we might know him and that he might know us and be reconciled to us. We're grateful, God, for that gift of salvation. And for that reason, Lord, it's why we gather together as a church, why we still seek to serve our community through this church, and why we seek to love one another in the way that you've instructed us. Thank you for the example you set on the cross, and thank you for loving and being patient with us individually and as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you so much uh, for joining this week's service. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Bye. Dream.